Very good evening to all of you. I'm Sameer Kurde and I welcome you all to Ayuka. And at the beginning itself, we we'll want to thank you for coming uh, here on such a rainy day from different parts of the city to be a part of this uh, special lecture. We always try to want to uh, try to excite you about the scientific activities, especially in astronomy, which is the field of Ayuka. And so as we always promise, we get you some experts from across the world and they come and deliver some interesting talks where we get information about some cutting edge thing happening in the world. So, uh, today we are lucky to have here Dr. Gordon Squires and he is here uh, on a special mission uh, to talk about something which is dear to him which is public outreach and of course this talk is also a part of that. It is part of a bigger meeting which is happening here. And India being a very big part of this special project that he will talk to you about. Uh, it, it's our privilege that we get to be part of uh, such a project and then we have to communicate it to everyone. So uh, there's been a meeting there and we've been busy all day, but still Gordon has taken Dr. Gordon has taken our time to give a talk here. So uh, I'll do a brief introduction and then quickly call him up on stage. Uh, the TMT is uh, popularly, uh, as it is popularly known, uh, it stands for 30 meter telescope. And uh, Dr. Gordon is the leader of the public outreach and the communications team of the uh, TMT. And he is based in California. He, he works at the California Institute of Technology. And he leads a team which uh, works on various telescopes which are run by NASA. These may be ground based or space based. And uh, his favorite work is to uh, uh, you know, carry these amazing results which these telescopes produced to the public. Of course, he's also an astronomer. He's, uh, he's comes to the regular way of uh, being a graduate, postgraduate in physics and getting a PhD in astrophysics. And uh, of course, he's an astronomer who works on several observations. But his favorite job is to communicate astronomy to the public. And so uh, this short introduction, I would like to call on stage Dr. Gordon Squires to, ex to share with us a universe of wonder. Good evening. Can, can you hear me all right? No, no you haven't switched it. Let's try it out. Can you hear me? All right in the back. Good evening. It is a true pleasure to be here this evening. I'll describe a little bit of the work um, I, uh, me and many others are doing around the world in collaboration with some of the best scientists and engineers and business people in India to build uh, the world's largest telescope, the 30 meter telescope. So I will say a few words about that and a, a collaboration with in which it's truly an honor for me to be a part of and to work with my colleagues here in India. As Samir said, I'm an astronomer and I could bore you with my own research tonight. I'm very good at boring people with the work that I do. But instead I wanted to do what Samir suggested is my team, our job is to communicate astronomy results from a number of NASA telescopes and TMT and other telescopes as well with the public. So, this is a, truly an honor for me as well because every day I wake up and somebody tells me about something they discovered. And it's always a surprise to me. And then my job is to take things which only a scientist would love and turn it into something that we can all appreciate and understand. So some of the things that I find that have changed my view of the universe I'd like to share with you this evening. My story tonight begins 400 years ago with a very familiar object I hope to most of you, if not all, right here in our cosmic backyard, Saturn, the planets in our solar system, one of the largest planets in our solar system. And 400 years ago, with one of the first telescopes that humans ever used, uh, one of the early astronomers, Galileo, turned his telescope towards Saturn and looked to see what he would see. This is a drawing that Galileo made from his observations. And he saw that Saturn looked a little odd to him. It wasn't a round object in the sky, but it had somewhat similar to what Galileo would have seen under good conditions. This is 
taken with a telescope called the Galileo scope. It was produced uh, in 2009 for the International Year of Astronomy. It's a replica of this telescope, and it's widely available for the public. It mimics some of what he may have seen 400 years ago. And only 50 years later, with the advance of telescopes, uh, a Danish astronomer, Christian Huygens, observed Saturn again. And he observed it over the course of, Sa of, of a long time, as uh, 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 of the orbit of Saturn around the sun. And now, 50 years after the first observation, or less than 50 years after the first observation, he starts to see what is familiar to us, this beautiful ring structure around Saturn. Well, if we fast forward to the modern era, this is the view of Saturn taken by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope in an image that was released in 2004. Now, arguably, Hubble is one of the most capable space-based telescopes ever created. And you can see from Hubble the exquisite structure in the rings around Saturn. You can see structure in the atmosphere around Saturn, different colors of bands referring to different chemistry or different uh, structure in the atmosphere of Saturn. Of course, we don't have to look at planets just in light that our eyes can see. You can look at other wavelengths of light. And this is a heat map of Saturn. This was taken from a ground-based telescope, the Keck telescope, that's based in Hawaii. I'll mention a little bit more about Keck in a moment, but at, the, at, at this moment, it is almost the largest ground-based telescope in the world. And it took a view of the heat distribution of Saturn. And so you can see some interesting things. Darker colors are colder parts of Saturn. Lighter colors are warmer parts of Saturn. So unlike on Earth, the equator is actually colder of Saturn and comes from shadowing of sunlight by the ring structure. It's warmer at the pole. And of course, we're not restricted to studying Saturn just from the ground. NASA flew a telescope, which is still in orbit around the Saturn system. It's a telescope called Cassini. And this is a view of Cassini, a composite of many, many, many images that was put together by NASA of the Saturnian system. And now you can see from a telescope that's in orbit around this planet, extreme details in both the ring structure and some details in the atmosphere as well. I don't know if it's visible to you or not. Can you see just above my green dot, uh, pointer a little dot? This is a familiar dot, I'm sure, to many of you. Yeah, how many of you know what that dot is? Europa. Europa, I heard some people say Europa. Earth? Yeah, this is Earth. That's us. Everything that was, everything that uh, we have had on our planet is represented in that tiny, tiny, tiny little dot in this image. So why am I talking about Saturn? So this, this image was taken in 2007, almost 400 years after Galileo first turned his telescope towards Saturn. And so you may argue that this planet, which is, if you will, in our cosmic backyard, has been studied by astronomers for 400 years by the best telescopes we have on Earth, by arguably the best telescope we have in space, the Hubble Space Telescope, and by not just Cassini, but other missions, but in particular Cassini, which is in orbit around Saturn. So we should understand Saturn, you may think, fairly well. Well, one day, in 2000 and, well, we'll see the date on the, on the next slide, 2008, 2009, a uh, paper was given to me. It was a paper uh, being published in one of the most prestigious journals uh, that astronomers publish in. And it completely changed our view of what Saturn looks like. And what, we, what the authors discovered in 2009 is that you can't see it here, but this is a little zoom in of the Saturnian system of Saturn and its rings. This is the Keck image I showed, or an Keck image I showed before. But what these astronomers discovered is that, in fact, there is a vast, huge, huge, huge ring far away from Saturn, the main rings of Saturn that we have never seen before with over 400 years of observations of this planet. And it was only discovered by a new NASA telescope called the Spitzer Space Telescope, and it's a telescope I've worked uh, with since 2001. 
And it views the heat radiation in space from various objects. I'm going to show you a number of results from Spitzer. And what it detected was the glow, the heat of this giant, giant ring around Saturn. And so as an astronomer, this is exciting to me, that one of the things that we have been studying and studying well with every asset we have for over 400 years, it turns out that we had only touched the tip of the iceberg, and we were only starting to understand this system and what it, what it is about. So you can well imagine that if we are just discovering Saturn, what is the true nature of Saturn and its ring systems, that there are many, many, many things in the universe yet to be discovered. And one of the ways we're going to discover them is with a new telescope, the 30 meter telescope. I'm just going to say a few words about this um, in a few charts that have a lot of words. And I don't want to scare you with the words. Uh, but what I want to say about TNT is that it will be the world's largest telescope. It'll have over almost 10 times the collecting area of the world's largest telescopes today. And it will be built in Hawaii. And it is a collaboration uh, amongst institutes in Canada, in the United States, Caltech, where I'm based at the University of California. These are both universities in California. The National Observatory of China, the National Observatory of Japan, and various institutes in India, including IUCA here. And some private funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Gordon Moore was, uh, is the uh, founder of the Intel Corporation, the Intel chips, which are in most computers, including this one right here. So this is an interesting collaboration. I don't know of any time in history that institutes from the United States, Canada, China, Japan, and India have come together on a project of this scale to build the world's largest telescope, a project that will cost over one billion US dollars. And never before in history has these entities come together to try to attempt such an audacious effort. Why would we do this? Why would we try to build this telescope? Well, I want to go back to the beginning to the times of Galileo. And before 1609, this was state of the art for astronomy. It was looking up at the stars with your eyes. And if you don't have anything else except your eyes, you're limited by what your eyes can see. So no matter what you look through, if you look through the, the tube of a tree, all you will see is what your eyes can resolve. What Galileo discovered Galileo and others, in particular some, some other astronomers in Northern Europe, is that if you have a lens, you can bend the light and improve what you can see. And in 1609, as I showed you what he discovered about Saturn, he discovered many other things as well, which are familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. He discovered that Jupiter has moons. He discovered craters on the moon, spots on our own sun, and that Venus has phases, much like the phases of, uh, of, of our own moon. And these discoveries, as, as, as I'm sure you know, shook the philosophical foundations of society at that time. It changed our view of the universe. But the very first telescope changed our view of the universe from the Earth being the center of the universe to suddenly being the Earth just being another body that orbited around the sun. And these revolutions continued through history. Every time the world's largest telescope was built, our view of the universe changes. So in 1789, William Herschel built what was at that time the world's largest telescope. It was funded, much like many of modern telescopes were, by a benevolent king. And he discovered, one of his many discoveries with this telescope is binary stars. So our own sun is a star, just like the stars you see at night twinkling in the sky. And he discovered that there are stars that orbit around each other. And this proved for the first time that gravity is not just the phenomenon that governs our own solar system, but all of the other stars in the sky are also governed by gravity. Rossi's 1.83 meter telescope, and these sizes refer to the size of the lens of the telescope. So the lens of Rossi's telescope was 1.83 meters across. And he discovered that there are what he called spiral nebulae in the sky. And on the left is a drawing of a galaxy, a spiral nebula, he didn't know what it was at the time, that Rossi took 
1789 or so. And this is the modern view taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see even in 1789, there was cutting edge astronomy being done. And, he was, and astronomers were discovering things in the sky that didn't, they didn't understand and what, what they were. The first telescope to be built on a mountaintop, the understanding that it is better to move away from urban centers in order to build cutting edge observatories. The first uh, mountaintop observatory was built in California. Uh, it was also the start of big telescope building in the United States was a 36 inch refracting telescope. Uh, which was the world's largest at the time. And the next telescope that came shortly after that, also in California, was a 100 inch, and I apologize for mixing inches and meters. This is because I live in both, I come from Canada where we talk meters, and I live in the United States where we talk inches and feet. But anyway, this telescope had a, uh, uh, a lens that was 100 inches across. And with this, a famous astro astronomer named Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. So again, as we started building bigger and bigger telescopes, our universe, our view of the universe continued to change. At my own university in California, the founder of this university is an astronomer named George Ellery Hale, and he built in his lifetime the world's largest telescope three times, all in Southern California. And it was instrumental in founding my university. And then we reached, um, and, and actually, if you don't know the history of this person, uh, it's worth reading. He was responsible for founding Caltech, arguably one of the finest universities in the world. He built the world's largest uh, telescope three times. And the interesting, and so a brilliant person, he was also responsible for a lot of the architecture in the town in which I live in California, Pasadena, California, our Civic Center, our, our City Hall, and so on. Um, a very, very brilliant person. And he was crazy. <laughs> And he knew he was crazy, so he wouldn't have minded me saying that. Uh, he said that he was inspired by an elf to build the world's largest telescope. An elf, a dark elf, came and visited him in the night to tell him this. Now, maybe, maybe a dark elf is. I, I, I should be. Uh, I, I should give uh, Dr. Hale some. Uh, so he actually went away for two years to chop wood to try to dispel these images that kept flooding into his brain, and then came back and built the world largest telescope. So if any of you like me have some crazy thoughts from time to time, there's still hope that we can do great things. <laughs> when we reached the size of telescope that 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 was being built, we reach an impasse. You cannot continue building bigger and bigger telescopes without new ideas. And two physicists, Jerry Nelson and Terry Mast, came up with the idea of instead of trying to build one big, now we're not talking lenses anymore, we're talking mirrors. Uh, instead of building bigger mirrors, why don't you get the same collecting area of light by putting together a bunch of small mirrors? And with their ideas and a consortium of universities in California, they built what are now the two largest telescopes in the world, the Peck telescopes on Mauna Kea. There's a mirror in there, and it's made up of 36 individual mirrors, all put together in order to make a 10 meter surface to make the large, largest mirrors in the world. And over the time of this march through history, we, we started with Galileo in 1609, and as time progresses, we continue as a species to build larger and larger telescopes. And it's interesting, over time, there's sort of a trend of what is the largest telescopes you could build at any given time was Keck, the world's largest telescope built there. This is what we're trying to do with the 30 meter telescopes. You can see we're extrapolating on what our predecessors did over history of continuing to be able to build larger and larger telescopes. And the understanding is then, as we build the world's largest telescope now with TMT, as all of these other telescopes did before us, we will have our view of the universe changed yet again fundamentally. So just to compare it, this is the telescope that uh, Hale built, which was the world's largest telescope at the time, the third of the three telescopes he built. This is the world's largest telescope, a representation of its mirror right now. And this is what we're trying to build together with our colleagues in India and Japan and China and Canada, the world's largest telescope, a 30 meter mirror. Now, 30 meters, that's hard to wrap your mind around. Um, who has a cell phone in here tonight? 
You don't have a cell phone? You have a camera? Who has a camera on your cell phone? All right, me too. I'll put my cell phone down there. But if you look at the lens of the camera on your cell phone, how large is it? A few millimeters across, maybe? So now imagine a cell phone that has a 30 meter lens on it. And I didn't measure it out, I meant to, but I think just by looking visually, it is roughly comparable to the size of this auditorium. So imagine that the camera, the lens of your, your camera on your cell phone was the size of this room. That's what we're trying to build uh, with the world's largest telescope. And you can well imagine, right, with a camera that large, you can see things much, much, much fainter than you could ever see with your cell phone or even our, with the world's largest telescopes today. You can see much, much, much finer detail than you could ever see with a much smaller camera. And that is part of the motivation for why we built something like this. So if you take a look around, just look around you. Imagine a mirror the size, a lens, if you will, a camera the size of this room. So not only are we built, I'm not going to dwell on this, but there's another feature being built into the telescope. It's a, it's a concept called adaptive optics. It, it's, it's helping correct for the blurring of our atmosphere. The things that make stars twinkle at night, maybe not tonight. <laughs> but, but many nights, the, the twinkling of the stars, stars shouldn't really twinkle. If you go to outer space, stars don't twinkle. It's the effect of the light coming through our atmosphere that makes them twinkle like that. And there's, a, there's a, a technology called adaptive optics that can remove that twinkling. It involves firing a laser up into the atmosphere and removing that jittering around of the star to make it stationary. And I'll just show you visually what this sort of technology can do. So this is a picture of the planet Uranus taken uh, with a standard telescope without this corrective technology of adaptive optics. And if you turn on adaptive optics with the same facility, this is what you can see. Let's see that again. So you see without adaptive optics, and that's turning it on. And not only could we study then objects in our own solar system, we could study things out in space. So this is a field filled with stars. And this is what you can see from a telescope, one of the world's best telescopes at the moment, in this very, very crowded field. Actually, every one of these little blobs of light, which looks so fuzzy up here, is actually a star. And if we turn on adaptive optics, you can see it much clearer. And this is actually a view of our, the center of our own galaxy, the galaxy, the Milky Way. If we look towards the very, very center of it, without adaptive optics, with adaptive optics. And so there's some very interesting things we can do by studying the center of our own galaxy. And then here's another view of a, of a very star, crowded star field without and with. So I think you can agree that this te technology, even here from the ground, will allow us to see much finer detail than you can see in any other way, correct? Right? All right. So that's TMT. TMT is a project. We just started our construction phase on Monday. So we announced on Monday that we are moving forward and starting to build this on Hawaii. So for the next 10 years, we will be busy building this telescope. And for many of our young astronomers here in the crowd, and you, when you finish school and you become an astronomer like me, this telescope will be there waiting for you to use. What have we learned from some of the other telescopes that we work on? And I want to take you just in our remaining time through a tour of some of the things I found interesting from the telescopes we have right now with the understanding that all the things I'm going to show you, many of them will be surpassed and we will learn even more wonderful things with new telescopes like TMT. But let's look at what we've learned from what we have right now. And I hope you'll find some of these things interesting as I do. Let's start right here in our own solar system. Our own solar system is comprised of the Earth, the Sun. What else? What else is in our solar system? Planets, anything else? Asteroids? Your cloud, comets? Asteroids are something we're kind of interested in because asteroids can hit Earth. Asteroids hitting Earth, if they're small ones, it's not a bad thing. If they're big ones, it's a problem. This is our view of what our solar system looked like 
before a telescope that NASA flew a few years ago. So every one of these little red dots was the belief of the density of asteroids in our solar system. There's our sun in the middle. Which planet is that, the closest planet to the sun? And this one? Venus? Earth. So if you look at the neighborhood around Earth, a lot of asteroids. This is our view of what space in our own cosmic backyard looked like before this telescope called WISE, an infrared telescope from NASA flew. And this is what they, our view of the solar system has changed into since before and after the telescope flew. So what do you notice on the left-hand side of this, of this image? Are there more dots or less or fewer? Fewer. So there's actually fewer objects, and in particular, fewer objects in the orbit of Earth than what we thought of before. So it turns out, by flying, flying one little telescope, suddenly space got a lot safer. You know, when I started uh, my very first postdoc after I finished my degree, there were nine planets in the universe known. The nine planets in our solar system. This is when Pluto was still a planet. Pluto isn't a planet anymore, as you well know. We all agree Pluto got what it deserved, right? <laughs> Some of us in the audience were there voting. I was there voting for Pluto. But I actually voted for Pluto. It's a long story. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when I started my research career after my degree, there were nine planets in the, in the whole universe. That's all we knew. We didn't know if there were any others. Now, there are reasons to believe there should be. We saw all these stars in the sky. And, People ask themselves, why would our solar system be the only solar system in the universe to have planets? Seems unlikely, but we didn't know that. There was no other planets known. And a professor at my university, the University of California at Berkeley, in the, a couple of weeks after I arrived there, announced the discovery, along with some another group in Europe, of the first planet known to orbit around another star. It was a very, very phenomenal time for me. I, I was watching this as a periphery doing my own research, but suddenly, you know, our department was filled with people from the media wanting to talk about planets. So, of course, since then, we've discovered that there are many, many, many more planets, and as I'll show you in a minute, probably around every star you see in the sky, there are planets, but we didn't know that when I started my career. And in fact, we didn't know, do planets only form around a certain type of star? Now, this may or may not be familiar to you, but, but let, me, let me share with you that when you look up at the night sky and you see all those twinkling stars, they're not all the same. Some of those stars are huge, much, much, much larger than our own sun. And some of them are, in fact, most of them are tiny. They're much smaller than our sun. And all of those are up there in the night sky. And a question we had up until only a few years ago was, can planets exist around all of these types of stars? And the answer is yes. So this is an artist's representation of the largest type of star in the universe, called a hypergiant. This is what a, a big hypergiant would look like. And to give you an idea of the scale of how large this star is, right below it is a representation of our own solar system. So if you were to put our own solar system right beside a hypergiant, the largest stars in the universe, the size of this star would encompass all of the inner planets up to almost the orbit of Mars. That's a big star. These stars don't last very long. They, they, they live fast and die young. Uh, they burn up all their fuel very, very fast. They're extraordinarily hot stars. And what we discovered only a few years ago is that the conditions for forming planets around these stars exist. Now, these stars don't last very long, so it was an open question would there be enough time to form planets, because they die fairly quickly. But the material that was needed to form planets remained around these stars, so it's possible even in the largest, hottest, most extreme stars in the universe that there could be planets. And on the other edge of the scale of the size of stars, I said to you, when you look up at the night sky, some of the stars are bigger than our sun, most are smaller. And that's true. This is a representation of our own sun with a representation of some of the planets in our solar system. And this is a representation of what may be the most common type of star in the universe, uh, 
uh, called the Brown Dwarf. It's not quite a star, it's not quite a planet. It's so small, it's right on the border of what it is. Um, but what the Spitzer Space Telescope, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, has discovered is that even around the smallest stars in the night sky, and, and again, there's many, many, many more of these than there are of stars like our own sun, even around the smallest ones in the night sky, there are planets, or the conditions for planets at the very least. And what do these planets look like? Now I'm going to show you a couple of plots that only an astronomer could love. Maybe you could love it, so try it. Uh, this is a, a moment in history which I will never forget. You know, there's a day in history when for the first time somebody has detected directly the light from a planet outside our solar system. All of these other things I've described to you up till now have been indirect inferences that there are planets or the conditions for forming planets. But one day I received in my office two papers from two science teams that had independently, for the first time, detected light from a planet around stars other than our own sun. They're two different stars. They have, again, names that only an astronomer would love. These are the names of these two stars. And this shows the light as viewed over time when a planet orbited around these stars. And I'll show you what it looks like and what this means. But basically, from a scientific point of view, this little dip in the light you can see here allows us to measure how much light was coming from this planet itself. It was the first time in history we actually saw light from a planet around another star. And using this sort of phenomena, we've been able to infer some remarkable things about these planets that are being discovered. So for example, this planet on the left, this is a weather map. This is a weather map of a planet which is a long ways away from us. And it has a hot spot which is about two hours after noon. So around 2 p.m. on this planet, if it had a 24-hour system, would be the hottest time of day on this planet. That's very similar to Earth, actually. The hottest time of day here on Earth is not right at noon. It's a couple of hours later. That's because our jet stream that, that flows moves heat across from underneath the sun further away. And so the jet stream on this planet, however, is not like the jet stream on Earth. The speed of the jet stream on Earth is around 100 miles an hour, so 160 kilometers an hour or so. This jet stream on this particular planet is around 6,000 miles an hour, transporting heat away. And then there's this planet, another planet was studied by Spitzer, and it is the hottest planet still known to us. It has a temperature in its upper atmosphere of almost 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So planets out there can look pretty weird. But there's, there's also some interesting things around these planets, and, and these are, I think, the last sort of scientific, pure scientific plots I'll show you. But what these two planets that were observed were using the technique I showed you earlier was looking for what is the chemistry in the atmosphere of these planets. And in particular, what they found uh, on the left-hand side is in a system where planet, planets are forming, there is a tremendous amount of water enough water actually to fill Earth's oceans five times. And but not only that, but there's some very interesting chemical compounds around this planet, but planet acetylene, hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide. And those are nasty sounding names, but these are actually some of the ingredients we need to put together to form the components that form biotic molecules, things that enable life as we understand it now. So planets out there we're discovering not only does every star almost every star in the sky have a planet or the conditions for forming planets, but there's a lot of water there and there's a lot of molecules that it, in, in particular could be useful for supporting her, her life. And this is a plot that's a little bit out of, uh, out of date. Um, the Kepler telescope, another NASA telescope, has now confirmed not, there's no longer nine or eight planets in the, solar, in the universe. There's over 3,000 candidate planets and over 1,000 confirmed planets uh, uh, out in the night sky. And from this we can infer that in our galaxy alone, just in the Milky Way, one of many, many, many galaxies in the universe, there's probably an order in our galaxy alone, 100 billion planets. So that's quite a step from the beginning of my career when we started out with nine. We've now gone to 100 billion. 
That should be enough to keep you and me busy for the rest of our careers. <laughs> you know, and some of these planets are interesting too, and I'll tell you a story about one particular planet. It's called Kepler 16b. Uh, Kepler is the name of the telescope. It's a NASA telescope in outer space. So Kepler is the name of the telescope that enabled the discovery of this planet. It was the 16th planet discovered by Kepler. It was the second one in the solar system. So that's what this, uh, this, this means. And it's actually a planet that orbits around two stars. So this is an artist's representation of it. So if you were in this planet, Kepler 16b, you would see not one sun, you would see two, and you would orbit around them both. Now, the thing that is interesting about this is, how many of you saw the uh, the original Star Wars movie? You know, with Luke Skywalker, not 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 the original, not the new reboot, but the old one, Luke Skywalker and, uh, and Solo, the original. One. How many saw that? All right. Do you remember this image? With Luke Skywalker on Tatooine, looking out at the twin settings of the, the Tatooine stars. So the director of this film, George Lucas, back in the time when he was making this movie in the 1970s, he went to some, uh, and I won't say who, but he went to a famous astronomer in the United States. And he asked this astronomer, he said, is this possible? Could you have a star, a planet, that orbits around two stars? And the famous astronomer said, no, oh, no, that's not possible. There's no way you could do this. So Lucas said, fine, thank you. And he decided to show it anyway, because he, he wanted to show that this planet, <laughs> he wanted to show that this planet looked different from Earth. This was really our, remember that, for those of you who saw this movie when it first came out, it was a really new way of us viewing the universe. He wanted to show us that Tatooine looked different from Earth. So he said, I can do this by having the twin sunsets. So he ignored the famous astronomer. Well, that was in the 1970s, so you go forward 30 years, it turns out George Lucas was right. The astronomer was wrong. It is possible. Now, how do you make something like our own sun? You know, we didn't know how to do this. Uh, this is a, a region of space where, in fact, many stars, some like our own sun, are being born right at the moment of this picture when it was taken. When I say right at the moment, it's not you know, within the next five minutes, it's over the next hundred million years or so. But for an astronomer, that's almost instantly. For some of you tonight, that might seem like how long my talk is. <laughs> this region of space has a lot of material, a lot of gas, a lot of dust, and these things are coalescing together to form stars. It turns out that there is a big, massive star, much like that hypergiant, that big star I showed you earlier, there was a big, massive star in the center of this cavity that was throwing so much radiation, so much, so much energy out into space that it has carved out this region of space here. There's another one down here. And while this big, massive star here and somewhere in here was doing this, it was compressing all of this other material, pushing it together. And while it did this, it created regions where other stars could be born. So by this big, fairly destructive star that lived in here somewhere, and one in here, and pushing together this material that allowed other stars to form. I have a little cartoon that shows that. It's a similar type idea. So you have a region of space, big cloud, sitting there doing it, minding its own business, not doing much, and nearby you have another massive star. In this particular case, this star is going to explode. This happens, it's called a supernova. And you'll see the sort of compression and what happens and how this cloud reacts. So as the shock wave from the supernova hits the cloud, it starts pushing this material together, and it allows a whole new generation of stars to be born. Let's see that again. It's a phenomenon in astronomy we call triggered star formation. And so for the first time with some of the recent telescopes flown by NASA, also by our colleagues in Europe, we were able to study this phenomena with images like I just showed you, and see regions where this material was being compressed together and new stars are being formed. And we're able to study deep into the heart of these types of regions. So this is a view of the night sky that you would see if you looked at it with your eyes, with visible light. Can you see a lot of stars in this case, but there's a region in here where you get a hint, can you see if there's a little bit of 
nebula in there. Can you see that in there's the two faints? Can you see that in the back there? This is what you'd see with your eyes. If you look at it in a different wavelength of light, looking at the heat radiation, the infrared light coming out of here, this is what this same region of space looks like. And every one of these little bright spots you see in the middle here, something we call the tarantula nebula because it looks like a tarantula. Uh, each one of these are stars just being born. And so recently now using space-based infrared or heat sensitive telescopes, we can study the first moments of star formation, how you form something like our own sun. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, you just look at the sun, again, not today or not since I came here a few days ago, but hopefully soon. If you ever look up in the night, in the day sky, and you look at our own sun, have you ever wondered, how do you make something like that? Well, that's something as astronomers we wonder about all the time. How do you make the sun? How do you make each and every one of those stars we see in the night sky? For the first time, for the first time. In more detail now, we can see how to do that with some of the modern telescopes. Let's get that slide. You know, here's, it's a little bit more technical, but it's interesting to me at least nevertheless. Up until recently, I told you that there are stars like our sun, and it turns out our, our sun is a cosmic oddball. It's rather larger than most of the other stars in the universe. But we didn't know how many smaller stars there were for every star like our sun. And up until a few years ago, we thought that, well, for everything like our oh, like a star like our sun, there was probably maybe five or so smaller stars. So, so for everything like our sun, you can expect five smaller ones up in the night sky. Does that make sense? But there was a new census done, enabled by a, a NASA telescope called GALAX. It's an ultraviolet telescope that looks at the light from the sky in the ultraviolet wavelength. They found out that for every star like our sun, there isn't five small stars, there's 25. So our whole understanding of how many stars and what types they were and what sizes they were were revolutionized relatively recently as well. What happens to all these stars? This is the one scary slide. Oh, no, it's the next one. The next slide is scary. This one isn't scary. Don't be scared, right? <laughs> How many people in this audience tonight are amateur astronomers? What, yeah, okay, a lot. Have you looked at uh, Myra? How many people have looked at Myra? You have? Yeah, many. It's a common target for amateur astronomers, for professional astronomers as well, uh, studying this star uh, in our own galaxy. So many of us have looked at this, we've studied it for many, many years, and what was only discovered a few years ago is, not only is the star Lyra interesting in its own right, but it has a huge, huge, huge tail of material behind it. Turns out this star is not just sitting minding its own business in the galaxy, it's moving through the galaxy at high speed. And it's interacting with the material and it's leaving a wake of fluorescent material that is 13,000 light years long. So much, much, much larger, much, much, much larger than our solar system, much larger than the distance to the nearest star outside our solar system. 13,000 light years, the, the, the distance light travels in 13,000 years. And we only discovered this huge long tail recently again with this ultraviolet telescope galaxy. The depth of stars, this is the scary. So this is a snapshot of what life on Earth is going to look like, life around Earth is going to look like in about five billion years. This is what our solar system will look like. What this is, is an image of a star that has died. So it's a star like our own sun. Our own sun right now is busily taking hydrogen, putting it together to form helium, a process called fusion. That generates a lot of energy, and it's been doing that for about 5 billion years, and it'll do it for about 5 billion more. But when it runs out of hydrogen, what's going to happen to it, it's first going to expand out. So our, our own sun will get very large. It will probably get large enough that Earth will be inside it. And then it will throw off a tremendous amount of material into space and shrink down into a, a cold, cooling ember that no longer generates its own uh, generates energy by fusion, but just is radiating out the heat of the space. It's a, uh, a dead star called the white dwarf by astronomers. So that's what's going to happen to our sun in five billion years. 
So if you're in the real estate business, if you're worried about your homes, uh, five billion years from now, a good time not to be in the neighborhood anymore. Uh, this is what will happen. So this is what happened here. So in the middle of this image is a star like our own sun uh, that has died. This is a lot of the uh, material that threw out into space in this last moments of its life. Interestingly, a lot of this material may be recycled into the next generation of stars or planets or so on as well. But what happened in this solar system is this particular solar system likely had a comet, just like comets in our own solar system. And this comet was orbiting the star, as comets do. But when the star died, the orbit of this comet likely got disturbed. And it started coming closer and closer to the star until it was ripped apart. A lot of this red material you see is the remnants of that comet, which was ripped apart as it came too close to this dead star. So a phenomenon, again, that may happen in our own solar system five billion years from now. May we all be around to witness such a phenomenon. <laughs> Artist concept of one of the most lucky, you know, sometimes even astronomers get lucky. Uh, a colleague of mine actually at Caltech was studying a nearby galaxy with this telescope, Galax, uh, the ultraviolet telescope. And she was studying it for, a dip for her own science program, just interested in some of the nature of stars uh, in this galaxy. And over the course of two days of observations, she noticed a remarkable phenomena happening that she didn't expect to see. And it's represented in this artist concept of what happened in this galaxy. What happened is a star, similar to our own star, the sun, let's say, wandered too close to the center of this galaxy. And in the center of this galaxy was a very, very large, or is a very, very large black hole. A region of space where so much material is compressed into a small area that if anything gets too close and gets pulled into the black hole, it will never escape out. And this is what happened to this poor star. Over the course of two days, an entire star, like our own sun, wandered too close to this black hole, and it was ripped apart, and a tremendous amount of material fell into this black hole. So imagine that over the course of two days, something like our own sun just happened to wander by a bad part of the universe and gets ripped apart. And she found this just by accident. This isn't what, what she was looking for at all. It was just good fortune while she was studying something else that she was able to get the data to understand this phenomenon. And this has happened, I believe, two or three times now, always by accident, uh, that people have, uh, have known, noticed this phenomenon. Now, there is the opportunity, we believe there's a star in our own Milky Way galaxy to which this may happen as well this summer. We may see a very, we can predict the orbit of this star in our own Milky Way galaxy. And we're all crossing our fingers and hoping it gets eaten up by the black hole in the middle of the galaxy. It would be really cool. <laughs> and finally, our own galaxy. Now, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, this isn't the way you're normally used to seeing it. You're normally used to seeing a galaxy like our Milky Way that looks something like this. And you know, our Milky Way galaxy, center of our galaxy, has these majestic spiral arms. You know, our sun would be out here somewhere like this at the rare, you know, in the scale of this. This is an artist concept of our galaxy, obviously. Unfortunately, we can't get outside and take a picture of it yet. <laughs> it's probably for some time. But this is what we're used to seeing our own galaxy looks like. Oops, a long way. And this is a picture taken by Spitzer of the plane of our Milky Way. Is it's, this is a telescope that's in our own solar system, and it just took a picture of, our, of, of the plane, the disk of our Milky Way from within the Milky Way, stitched it together. There's a few things that are remarkable about this image. One is it is an 800,000 picture panorama. So have you ever taken panoramic images with your cell phone or with your, your cameras? You, know, you take one, two, three, so you can get a long, skinny picture. Can you imagine doing that with 800,000 different images? That's what Spitzer did to create this. And it's, such, it's a continuous, long, thin image. It's a, you imagine our Milky Way is a disk, like a, like a plate. So the image that Spitzer took is about that much of the sky, so about 120 degrees, with the thickness of my finger held, it up, held at arm's length. So it sort of took an 800,000 image panorama of a part of the sky that looks like that. Stitched it all together, and this is what our Milky Way looked like. So that's the center of our galaxy where the big black hole is. 
where we're all hoping a star will get eaten this summer. And then this is the whole plane of the Milky Way. It's a continuous image, continues here, back to here, and so on. It's, it was so long and thin, I couldn't represent it on this picture as one long thin image. You haven't seen it. Yet. And astronomers can use this type of data to really understand, and you, you see right away, right, that there are parts of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, that look very different from other parts. So, for example, this region out here looks pretty a lot different from this region here, or certainly this region here, right? You can see that. So, as you get out far into the outskirts of the Milky Way, all of these sort of bright regions are places where stars, like our own sun and other types of stars, are being born. As you get farther out from the center of the Milky Way, there are fewer and fewer of those, and then there are regions where there's a lot of stars being formed. And astronomers, and actually amateur astronomers and citizen scientists, are doing a census to try to understand how many stars are being born in our own galaxy right now. Because there's so much data that a single astronomer or even a team of astronomers uh, could never count up everything that is in them. And you can't use a computer because each region looks so special, computers miss things. So there's a citizen science project called, uh, it's under the Galaxy Zoo, so if you Google Galaxy Zoo and you look for the Milky Way project, you can participate in this tonight. You can go home and count places where stars are being born in our own galaxy. And our understanding of our galaxy as a nature, as a result of this research has changed. We used to think, that our own galaxy had four big spiral arms. Now we understand it only has two. Uh, we always knew, or we knew recently, that there's this sort of linear bar-shaped structure in the middle of our galaxy. But it turns out it's much larger, and it's pointed in a different direction than what we thought. So this previous image that I showed you helped us understand the nature of our own galaxy much better. And finally, if we, we move out into the distant universe, our view of what other galaxies look like has also changed recently. We used to think that galaxies, this is a, a very, very famous galaxy, again for amateur astronomers, M82, Messier 82, known as the Cigar Galaxy, colloquially. Uh, this is what it looks like in visible light. But if you look at it in infrared or in heat radiation, you see that there's this huge amount of material outside of the disk of this milky uh, of this of this galaxy so it turns out a lot of material is being thrown out of this galaxy and only with space-based telescopes that are sensitive in the infrared can we really resolve this phenomenon so we see that what we're used to seeing many of us at least are used to seeing for galaxies in fact look very very different if you look at them in different ways and they're much bigger than we thought we used to think that galaxies were relatively these compact little things with the spiral arms that either are regular and pretty and beautiful or sometimes a little messed up like this one. It turns out that there's huge, huge halos of material around what we can see when you look at it in other wavelengths of light. So even how big we thought galaxies were by just looking at what our eyes can see, turns out we were missing a lot of what there is in, what there is in these galaxies that are much larger than what we thought. And finally, recently, uh, a telescope there was a joint uh, collaboration between the United States and, 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 and Europe, led by the European Space Agency. The Planck Telescope uh, looked back to what we call the echoes of the Big Bang. So this is some of the remnant radiation from when the universe itself was created. Band across the middle is light from our own Milky Way galaxy, so that's stuff in the foreground. The stuff here you see when you get outside of our galaxy, that's all the echoes from when the universe was created some 13.8 billion years ago. And, you know, Planck is studying this in detail. In fact, many of you probably have studied it as well. If you have an analog television, you know, before HD and satellite TV and so on, remember rabbit ears, all that sort of good stuff, we need to off tune a channel that, that fuzz you see on the TV. That actually is also the echoes of the creation of the universe. So for you younger people, if you do not ever have an analog television again, you will be missing out at the beginning of the universe when you watch it. <laughs> so right now, we are at the leading edge. I mean, all of these discoveries I've shared with you have come in the last 10 years through a variety of telescopes looking at the universe in different ways. And we are, everything 
most of the things I knew when I started my career, and it wasn't that long ago, but it was long enough, I guess, you know, have been changed in one way or another by these facilities. And now, you know, I have the honor of being here with my colleagues in India and our colleagues in China and Japan, Canada, and the United States, and we're trying to build the world's largest telescope together so that what I showed you tonight, 10 years from now, will be old news as we learn again what else we can't even imagine about our universe right now. The 30 meter telescope will be able to look at some 2,000 stars in the nearby universe and look for oxygen in their atmosphere, oxygen like we breathe, giving indications that these planets, could they support life? Uh, and many other things. This, the 30 meter telescope will also be able to study the most distant objects in the universe, looking for the first moments when the stars first started to shine. The very first stars in the entire universe, TMT will be searching for. So we live in a special place and in a time, a time of wonder, certainly. And I look forward to coming back in 10 years when we, we take our first pictures with TMT and we'll discover together uh, what we see. Thank you.